Hi, everyone, and welcome uh, to the uh, Aga Khan Public Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Malkit Shoshan, and I am the RA head of the Art Design and Public Domain Program here at the GSD. And I'm also the director of uh, FAST, the Foundation for Achieving Seamless Territory. Um, we all know that space is political. Territory and spatial um, production lie at the heart of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Walls, checkpoints, earth mounts, buffer zones, watchtowers, tunnels, depopulated villages, ruins, unrecognized villages, refugee camps, cultural heritage sites, community settlements, outposts, and individual farms are only few of the special typologies that dominate the Israeli-Palestinian landscape. We also uh, learned from the previous Aga Khan uh, lecture by Suad Amiri, and we will hear more about it uh, today. Uh, there is a question that come, coming from architecture and urban planning and from the region. Uh, and the question is, how can we use our professional knowledge and tools to make visible this landscape of violence and challenge existing paradigms and power structure to develop alternative imaginaries and just peaceful and sustainable realities? It is my pleasure to introduce today Nora Akawi. Nora is an architect and curator currently based in New York. She is the director of Studio X Aman, a platform for public programming, research, and education on architecture in the Arab region, initiated by uh, Columbia University um, Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at the Columbia Global Center in Amman. She teaches a graduate, school, a graduate design studio, history theory, and visualization courses on borderlands, forced displacement, erasures, and counter mapping at Columbia GSAP. Nora co curated the uh, Friday Sermon, an exhibition at the Bahrain Pavilion for the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale. She also co-edited uh, two books, Friday Sermon and the Arab City Architecture of Representation. Nora is a member of affiliated faculty at the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia University and the steering committee for the Sijal Institute for Arabic Language and Culture in Amman. She completed her professional degree in architecture in Jerusalem in 2009, and in 2011 she received her master's in critical, curatorial, and co conceptual practices in architecture from Columbia University. Her thesis focuses on the role of archive in the formation and transform transformative spatial imaginaries uh, in Palestine. Welcome, Nora. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Malkit, uh, Dana, and everyone, uh, Paige and Patrick, for um, the invitation and for uh, making the stay here so far very warm. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, talking to people here at the GSD for the first time about my work. It's also a uh, pleasure to be um, given kind of ample <laughs> amount of time um, to and to use it for reflection on uh, the last few years, and especially in relation to a program like the Aga Khan program, where um, I think there are a lot of um, shared concerns and shared questions about how uh, to teach um, and how to study areas of the global south here in you know in universities like Harvard and and Columbia, so a lot of these questions that I'm going to be raising, I hope, will resonate with some of you, and um, um, and that it will not be 
very boring. Also, as Malkit mentioned, a lot of the work that I've been doing um, is kind of anchored in um, the politics of the archive being at the center of um, any political um, position, let's say. Um, and I will explain more about that, but you will hear a lot about archival practices in the coming few minutes. And I will read so that I don't go on forever. Um, so collective identities are based on an agreement of a shared experience from the past. The narrative of this experience, as a collective narrative, is built through a selection of stories and events. The process of selection requires not only active remembering, but also active forgetting. the active forgetting of certain elements of this past. According to Renan, in order to define a new identity or redefine an existing one, all those including it, included in it must consent on a shared act of forgetting any formerly built identity. National identity is then an agreement to actively forget the past, an action facilitated in part by the fabrication of official collective archives the materials, the documents that are selected to be injected into a nation's collective memory. Cartography is a primary tool for the fabrication of such documents. Each map is a reformulation of the identity of the space it represents. Each map is an archive. Every time an area is mapped, a new set of elements are strategically selected and rendered significant. Every time an area is mapped into a new identity, former identities are inevitably erased and sent into forgetfulness. The realms of memory, places, texts, symbols, or rituals, according to Pierre Nora, have become increasingly important. Our memory, especially in these times, is above all archival, he says. It relies entirely on the materiality of the trace, the immediacy of the recording, the visibility of the image. In Archive Fever, Jacques Derrida writes that the question on the politics of the archive is not one political question among others. And this is what I was referring to earlier. He explains that it runs through the whole of the, the, whole of the field and in truth determines politics from top to bottom. There is no political power without control of the archive. There is no political power without control of memory. The selection process of public archives is guided by what Derrida calls the principle of consignation. Consignation aims to coordinate a single corpus in a system or a synchrony in which all of the elements articulate the unity of an ideal configuration. For those in power, in an archive, there should not be any dissociation, any heterogeneity, or secret, which could separate or partition. There is a tribunal, Jean-Louis Dot says, which judges stories and events of history and includes or, include or excludes them or erases them from public record. The tribunal's role is to cleanse the collective archive from fiction friction, not fiction, and dissensus, to maintain a coherent, homogenous, seamless record of the past in order to ensure the homogeneity of the perception of collective identity and in the social imaginaries of the future. The archive's very reason to exist then lies in its potential destruction. Do you think maybe we could turn lights off? Or some? Thank you.
The meaning of the archive originates from the Greek archeion, the house, the domicile, the address, or residence of the superior magistrates, those who command, the archons. What Derrida calls the archivolytic power is the power to destroy the archive. The constitutive violence of a political power then rests on the possibility of refusing to recognize a debt. This violence is defined in contrast to the very essence of the archive since the denial of the archive is equivalent, in fact, to a denial of debt. This is why, as the famous quote goes, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. The maintenance of homogenous narratives and identities are necessary for the total regulation and control of the people. According to Jacques Rancière, a political community is a community of interruptions, fractures. It is irregular and local. It is, a political, it is a community of intervals between identities, between places. Political being together is being between, between identities and between worlds. Consensus, then, for someone like Rancière, is anti-democratic and therefore anti-political. Effective democratization, Derrida writes, can always be measured by this essential criterion, the participation in and the access to the archive its constitution, and its interpretation. In this sense, the call is for an archive that includes within it its conflicting material. Rather than an edited, whole, seamless, and homogenous narrative, they must facilitate debate, confrontation, and provide a space for encounter. Facing incessant destruction, like Melkit was mentioning earlier, looting and denial, um, Palestinians have maintained a steadfast resistance against the project of erasure and forgetting employed by the Israeli state. Rituals and classes, teachers and theaters, photographs and walks, melodies and stories are all mobilized for the specters of memory to stick around. In States of Fantasy, Jacqueline Rose writes that it's precisely the memory evaded, that archive burned, that place destroyed, that evidence buried, which returns to haunt us. The body of Israeli choreographer, Arkady Zaidis, in capture practice and in archive, what you see here on the screen, becomes the channel through which evaded memories are not only captured and inscribed, but also displaced, abstracted, and released in their most haunting, undeniable, indestructible form. The footage from which this work emerges was filmed by Palestinians who witnessed or were subjected to violence and human rights violations performed by settlers and soldiers maintaining the Israeli military occupation of the West Bank. The organization distributing the cameras and collecting and disseminating the videos is, re is the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights, B'Tselem, who, as part of the camera project, aims to produce evidence towards accountability. In other words, the recognition of debt. Capture Practice, this work by Arkady Zaidis, that was introduced to me by um, Maite Borchabad, a curator who curated an exhibition with his work and asked me to write about his, his, his uh, piece, is the ultimate preservation of this evidence, where memory is not only viewed and analyzed, it is internalized, performed, embodied, distributed. In this work, Zaidis identifies movements, analyzes them, extracts them, learns them and imitates them, and repeats them. Through his body and exhaustive repetition, the archive is at once recorded and reproduced. With the process of learning, initially very clumsy, eventually precise, the viewer participates and records, now able to reproduce. Repetition reaches the point of what uh, Pouillaud, a choreography critic, refers to in his dance's documentary text on this work as condensation, where the bodies and movements of various people are condensed into a choreographed representation of one collective body. Zaidis's own body becomes a site of inscription, a lieu de mémoire. In 
in his lecture at the University of Cape Town in South Africa in 1991, titled Identity, Authority, and Freedom. Edouard Said addresses the still very pressing question on academic freedom, on the dangers of the relationship between the university and both political and economic powers and authorities, and also on the privileges, but also the social and political responsibilities of civic institutions like the university. In the debate on academic freedom, on the one hand, we are faced with the argument that the university is to be exempt, purified even, of the everyday world. And on the other hand, the view that... It's distracting my view from the text. The view that directly involves the academic space in that world whereby the university is meant to be engaged intellectually with significant political and social change, and to be responsive to abuses of power. In this view, the university must not only be critical of, but also overtly align itself in opposition to oppressive regimes in power. The myth of the university as impermeable to the world outside, of course, no longer stands. Said mentions both the concealed and well-known at the time instrumentalization of academic institutions in the US by the government and the military, for example, during the Vietnam War, where academics and researchers were working on topics like counterinsurgency, lethal research or state, for the State Department or the CIA or the Pentagon. The Israeli Institute of Technology, also known as the Technion in Haifa, has developed remote control capabilities for Caterpillar D9R armored bulldozers. They were called the Black Thunder unmanned dozers, and according to an idea of soldier, the newly improved machine performed remarkably during Operation Cast Lead, which led to the destruction of Gaza in 2008-2009. At the time of Said's lecture in Cape Town in 91, Palestinian universities and schools were closed by the Israeli military, which had kept major universities in Palestine shut since the beginning of 1988. Palestinian universities are still targeted, both from the air and the ground. These are images from Al-Quds University's campus, raided by Israeli forces on November 2016, where they fired rubber-coated steel bullets and tear gas canisters at students. The systematic persecution of politically active students in Birzeit University by Israel or, by, or of Kurdish and Turkish academics for peace in Turkey for having signed the statement, we will not be part of this crime. All of these testify to the involvement of universities within the political realities outside. Another layer of challenges to the concept of academic freedom put forward by Said is in regards to the university's relationship to the state, particularly to, nation, to national identity building in the post-colonial states of the Arab world, where universities are not only nationalist universities, but are also designed as political institutions. For Egypt or Algeria, national independence meant that finally the youth would be educated in fully in languages and cultures of their own, as opposed to the colonial rulers' effort to establish the superiority of European learning. The first thing that was addressed after um, independence was education, and it went through a process of tarib in Arabic, which is Arabization of curriculum, intellectual norms, etc. But what this also meant was that the national universities were conceived as extensions of the new national security states and with a mandate of shaping national identity. So while before Arab students' education was encroached upon by colonial intervention of foreign ideas and norms, in the state-building process they were remade in the image of the rulers. This, of course, had devastating consequences for Arab universities. Academics were encouraged to conform rather than excel. The general result was what Edouard Said called a timidity, a studious lack of imagination, a careful conservatism came to rule intellectual practice. He writes that nationalism in the university has come to represent not freedom, but accommodation, not brilliance and daring, but caution and fear, not the advancement of knowledge, but self-preservation. So the only way to be free in the university was to stay completely unnoticed to be sure not to attract any unwanted attention. Our generation, I mean, this is from years ago, but our generation sadly knows this uh, all too well still. 
Self-censorship and timidity are certainly not foreign to academic environments today. This is true everywhere we look, but some cases highlight this in rather acute ways, as in the case of the University of Illinois professor Stephen Salaita, who joined the American Indian Studies program with a tenured offer um, and was fired on account of his statements on social media criticizing Israel's conduct of military operations in Gaza, for example. The university is, of course, also a site of protest. As a response to the university being regarded increasingly as, a simply, as simply an arm of the government, and that it had seemed to reflect only the interests of corporations and establishment power, Edouard Said gives an account of what he called a new worldliness in the university that denied it the relative aloofness that it once seemed entitled to. On the contrary, it called for the university to become a place where students would be educated as reformers. And so relevance was the new watchword. What all this highlights is the very basic fact that political repression, the lack of democratic rights, the absence of a pre press, all of these things, which are still very real today, have never been good for academic freedom. For Saeed, academic freedom is the freedom to be critical, the rejection of any kind of homely comfort in the academy. He writes that to make the practice of intellectual discourse dependent on conformity to a predetermined political ideology or a predetermined canon of learning is to nullify intellect altogether. And this is, I think, the punchline. He says that rather than viewing the search for knowledge in the academy as the search for coercion and control over others, we should regard knowledge as something for which to risk identity. We should think of, the acad of academic freedom as the invitation to give up on identity in the hope of understanding, or perhaps assuming, more than one. We must always view the academy as a place to voyage in, owning none of it, but at home everywhere in it. He says that the model for academic freedom should therefore be the traveler. For if in the real world, outside the academy, we must always be ourselves, inside the academy we should be able to discover and travel among other selves other identities and varieties of the human adventure. So he says that there are two ways of being in the academy, or any cultural space for that matter. Either as the academic professional who is there in order to reign, like the king, who um, is there to sit surveying everything with detachment and authority, defending particular borders, what should not be taught, what should not be included, defining disciplinary boundaries, reinforcing existing canons. But the second, the figure of the traveler, is considerably more mobile, more playful, although no less serious. The image of the traveler depends not on power, but on motion, on a willingness to go into different masks and rhetorics. Most of all, and most unlikely, and most unlike the potentate, who must guard only one place and defend its frontiers, the traveler crosses over, traverses territory, and abandons fixed positions all the time. So where my work lies is the potential that is already embedded in our schools to suggest architectures of education that are the opposite of assertive and static but that are mobile and willing to travel between worlds and traverse territories. Territories of identity, of disciplines, and of places. That are willing to constantly redefine their own context and positions, opening new territories not in order to own them, but to see how we could all be transformed by them and continue our ongoing quest for relevance. As an extension of Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, Studio X Amman has taken as a mandate to challenge and expand the established canons in architecture edu education and introduce new territories into the research agenda of the school, mostly on access, on migration, representation, and citizenship. Um, a book we published two years ago invited architects, urbanists, anthropologists, and historians <coughs> from around the world, including Suad Amiri, who was just mentioned before, to gather for a critical collective engagement with notions of identity, authenticity, representation in architecture in the Arab Mashriq. 
We had discussions on processes of fetishizing, mimicking, essentializing, and othering in architecture. There were also discussions on nested orientalism, the adoption of the image of oneself, people, or region as other, as it is drawn by orientalists, and the reproduction of the same image from one's own culture. There were conversations on lost identities, on lost modernities, on the many aborted projects that were imagined for the future of the Arab city and streets, especially since 2011. It was an alarm against the dangerous yet common expectation of architecture to participate in the definition and production of national identity and in projects of nation building, including those of Arab post-colonial nation states, and an examination of the instances where architecture is instrumentalized to design particular forms of citizenship to produce obedient, homogenized members of the nation and to exclude, often violently, those who don't fit within it, those who struggle to be recognized in it, to be represented. It was also a call to understand architecture as a potentially powerful marker of, ambigu of ambivalences, discontinuities, and instabilities, to paraphrase Felicity Scott. In her contribution to the book, Felicity Scott warns us, uh, similarly to Edouard Said, to think of a type of post-national figuration of architecture a paradigm that refuses to collapse into or even actively contest assumptions informing exclusivist notions like Egyptian architecture, Jordanian architecture, Lebanese architecture, and so on. In addition to considering architecture's role in colonial projects and in nation-building projects in the region, the book also addresses its participation in the extermination of identities and cultures, and it asks, what are the forces that have shaped the dominant representations in architecture in the Arab world? And which are the representations that have been silenced or erased in the process? And why? What were they why were they understood as threats? And what is their power? And what is their claim against the narratives of dominating powers and authority? What debt would they collect if they were heard? How do we excavate their stories? And how do we construct our own with these in mind. And so how do we think about construction in times as dark as the ones we're living in today? Not only for the regions of um, the world that we're working in, but for all the parts of the world that are being considered as disposable. A couple of years ago, Naomi Klein gave the address at the Edouard Said lecture in London about Orientalism, climate change, violence, and environmental racism. In this lecture, she reminds us that the transgressions that are executed against parts of the world, occupation, expulsion, destruction, including environmental violence against regions, livelihoods, and cultures, wouldn't have been possible without orders of systemic racism like Orientalism, a form of othering the disregarding, essentializing, denuding of the humanity of whole peoples and regions. She explains that the reckless refusal of governments to take action and responsibility in regard to climate crisis wouldn't have been possible without institutional racism. The recklessness wouldn't have been possible without Orientalism and other theories of human hierarchy. The tools that allows for the sacrifice of zones of the globe and the sacrifice of the rights, the bodies and cultures of those who inhabit them. The othering of territories and cultures softens the ground, as she says, for transgression, violent expulsion, etc., and cannot be separated from systems of colonialism and capitalism, etc. So this is where we remind ourselves that this violence of othering doesn't happen far away and in unfamiliar places. Practices of othering happen in educational and cultural institutions like the ones we work for and with, including universities. Not all of them, not all the time, but it happens. And with the important link that Klein makes between Orientalism and environmental racism, we can see that the violence we witness against entire populations as clear testimony to such institutions, that such institutions have not yet succeeded in ridding themselves of practices of othering. In, in academic institutions, the cultures and the places condemned to such violence, if they are taught or recognized at all, they are often exoticized, flattened, and often taught and researched as problems in need of a solution. And this leads us to Ananya Roy, 
In the 21st century metropolis, Ananya Roy urges us to rethink the geographies of human and regional theory, to blast open theoretical geographies, which requires dislocating the Euro-American center of theoretical production. This is the 21st century metropolis. Um, really important text. She writes that it's not enough simply to study the cities of the global south as interesting, anomalous, different, and esoteric empirical cases. Such forms of benign difference making, making keep alive, such forms of benign difference making keep alive the neo-orientalist tendencies that interpret third world cities as the heart of darkness and the other. She recalls, I forgot to move forward. She recalls Ash Amin's Regions Unbound towards a new politics of space is the name of the text, where he proposes a relational topological reading of regions, such that the local is viewed as a field of agonistic engagement with different scales of politics and social action. Roy's essay expands on Amin's call for a relational reading of territories and invites us to join an agenda for the study of the 21st century metropolis through the production of theory in the global south that is focused on a variety of dynamic topologies and deep relationalities. All of this is very um, abstract, but it will probably echo back um, when we go through some of the details of it. What she called, she calls this the worlding of cities. The proposition is, particular, is particularly to shift the emphasis from trait geographies to process geographies. We're invited to represent the forms of movement, encounter, and exchange that confound the idea of bounded regions with immutable traits. So all this to say um, process geographies um, as a way of understanding uh, territorial formations. And the interest in terms like worlding used in Ananya Roy's proposal for new regional and urban theory is shared by writers on international relations theory who borrow the practice of verbing from communication studies. The book Identities, Borders, and Orders, the editors uh, critique international relations theory as it's still largely based on stability, continuity, and territorial sovereignty as a master ordering principle that they consider insufficient for the study of the, for the study and theory of relations that are constantly in formation. They refer to communication theorists' work like Brenda Durvin, who questions, how can we focus on moves when all we have is nouns with which to work? The, they propose for international relations theory the approach of processual, relational, and verbing modes of thinking as a way of grasping identities, borders, and orders that are constantly in formation and in relation. So in response, international relations scholars have worked with terms like bordering, securitizing, refugeeing, etc. Mapping Borderlands is a mapping and research project initiated through Studio X Amman um, at Columbia University's GSAP. It situates itself at the tension between the rising intensity of migration across borders on the one hand, and on the other still fixed understandings and representations of territories and their boundaries um, as, and the static definitions of citizenship and human and citizen rights. In the introduction of the rights of others, Ben Habib writes that maybe the old political structures have waned, but the new political forms of globalizations are not yet in sight. This is a while ago, but this is where um, it's relevant. We are like travelers navigating an unknown terrain with the help of old maps, drawn at a different time and in response to different needs. While the terrain we are traveling on, the world society of, state, of states has changed, our normative maps have not. Mappings and essays developed through the Mapping Borderlands initiatives that I started with uh, Nina Kolovratnik at GSAP aims at identifying and representing processes, ambivalences, and discontinuities uh, following Felicity Scott's proposal mentioned earlier. The project takes as a starting point our understanding of territoriality that is still heavily rooted in our imagination of the world 
as divided into compartmentalized, distinct, and mutually exclusive formations. It considers that borders are physically manifested through fences and trenches, but also through biometric identification technology, refugee registration offices, and access to job and healthcare, fluctuating policies and regulations for migration. So what we are trying to do is um, understand movement and its suspension, both irregular uh, and regular, lawful and unlawful, recognized or unrecognized, as the central elements that define contemporary territories and geopolitical terrains. It mobilizes familiar visualization attributes and activates them not as static representations, but processes in themselves. Not to be taken as technologies of capture, but as techniques of addition. The hope is that rather than, rather than <coughs> reading borderlands as fixed and static conditions through a critical analysis and representation of processes of both fabricating and dismantling borders, new imaginaries for the territory can emerge. For example, in Means and Ends, uh, a research paper and cartographic exercise by Jason Danforth, one of the students who participated in the project, um, worked on a mapping collaboration with researcher Luigi Achilli, who um, his research focuses on the question, um, to what extent is human smuggling um, an irregular enterprise driven by solidarity and cooperation? This is, of course, also uh, during the um, heated and intensified criminalization of, um, of migration. And the focus on smuggling as, a, as an individual, the smuggler as this individual. So the, the visualizations aim to problematize the image of the smuggler as a, sim as a singular monolithic figure by identifying the many roles and individuals which compromise the web of smuggling networks. Operating under the model of Bruno Latour, this project is an attempt for Jason to draw things together and to represent the social and economic and territorial figures of the smuggler and their relationship to the movement across borders of people fleeing their homes. So Danforth, Danforth uh, traces the networks that facilitate the movement of bodies across traditional borders as they swell uh, as numerous third party actors enter the field further problematizing an already questionable dichotomy, and uh, with it, the legal repercussions for those who rely upon these networks to reach safety. So this is, for example, one of the um, experimentations with um, dismantling the kind of simplified representation of the movement across borders through an understanding of the networks of um, the networks that are necessary in the process of uh, fleeing Syria, and in this case, um, through Turkey to Greece. Mytilini, which is where we were. Um, another example of a sw swollen border is the no man's land region between Syria and Jordan. Um, in earthworks, borders, and in between settlements, C.C. Shen draws the Syrian-Jordanian neutral zone in 2014. Um, this is when Jordan closed its borders uh, to refugees from Syria, the, east, uh, the western borders, and people had to walk eastwards through the desert uh, to reach safety. It gradually transformed from July to November, which is also the time when she was doing this research, into an informal crossing point over trenches of sand and a, formal, and a formalized and militarized crossing point. Today, over uh, 80,000 Syrian refugees are stranded in this no man's land, um, which is um, often regularly closed off to humanitarian aid. There are plans now to um, build a, you know, an official camp in this area, a UNHCR camp. In the fall of 2016, um, another 
part and kind of we, we are slowly going back to where we started. Um, this is in the Negev uh, desert in Israel-Palestine, um, where uh, around 45 uh, villages, uh, unrecognized villages, are simply not present on the official maps of the area. Um, this project attempts to uh, trace the oral histories and narratives um, into visual languages that can capture some of the complexities of the relationship to this land, which is not recognized by the state. Uh, many of these um, villages have been um, destroyed repeatedly, uh, some of them um, still until you know, a week ago. Um, and part of the uh, work that uh, Stella Ioannidou in this project uh, tried to do is um, first collect all of the um, oral testimonies of destruction uh, that she found with the hope of also of continuing the project um, um, collecting others. But so documenting all of the testimonies of um, destruction and then also trying to see how these can be then uh, translated into a visual representation that is able to capture um, the villagers' uh, relationship to this land. So for her, um, every hostile act, what she calls the hostile act, is the demolition of particular element in the landscape, um, is kind of uh, represented in an additional layer uh, showing so each, each moment of destruction is in fact an additional evidence of um, this particular village's connection to this place. Um, and this is one of the experiments that she was working on. Drawing from the Julan uh, is a course that I teach with Khaled Malas in partnership with Amir Ibrahim, who is a researcher from the Golan Heights. It's a project dedicated to producing maps and architectural drawings that are aligned with the indigenous narratives of the Jolani people uh, and with their practices of refusal of settler colonial, colonial exploitation of the land there. Um, it's part of the larger Mapping Borderlands course. On May, 2000, on, uh, May 15, 2011, on the commemoration of the Nakba, and as part of a mass movement, uh, part of the 2011 mass movements of people calling for freedom, justice, and the toppling of colonial and oppressive regimes in the Arab region, uh, thousands marched in nonviolent protests towards the trenches and barbed wire in Rajd al-Shams' Valley of Tears uh, that separates the Golan Heights from the rest of Syria. Protesters were primarily Palestinian and Syrian refugees whose families were forcibly displaced from their land uh, with the systemic ethnic cleansing that uh, accompanied uh, the creation of the state in 48. Uh, and on this same day, marches of return um, were organized simultaneously in different places in Lebanon, Egypt, and Jordan, and in various cities uh, across the area. There is a refusal of these borders by people that was um, performed uh, in a choreography of resistance on that day, and then again uh, in June. Of course, it has to be mentioned that uh, there were many fatalities um, and people who were shot on that day. So, th so this project, Drawing from the Julan, is a collaboration with um, a Center for um, Human Rights, uh, Al Marsad, based in the Golan Heights. Um, and that follows this call by Anani Roy that was mentioned earlier um, to focus on process geographies rather than trait geographies. And since, since also this is an area that is um, um, not studied enough, We hoped that um, this kind of experimentation with visual uh, languages would um, would start to um, gather also different scholars scholars together who are working on the same topic. So Al Marsad um, 
the Arab Center for uh, Human Rights in the Golan Heights has been leading a huge effort of redrawing maps of the Jolan um, by locating and retracing the over 150 towns and over 100 villages um, that were razed to the grounds and destroyed um, in the few years after 1967. And around 130,000 people were expelled within uh, a matter of days. Uh, this is, for example, uh, Zaura. And what it looks like today, this is a uh, military training camp today with, um, for the IDF. So learning from and in alliance with organizations like Al Marsad, we organize readings, writings, and drawing uh, around four core notions through which we try to understand and grasp this region. One is edges and borders. The second is ruins and excavations. The third is resources and their extractions. And the fourth is images and imaginaries. Um, after that, uh, students explore um, the writings and the films and images by artists and writers uh, from the Julan, and then propose their um, drawing and ma their drawing and, and writing projects, and then we travel there to test whether these are relevant um, or or even manageable. And then the rest of the uh, semester is dedicated to back in New York to developing the mapping projects. This is um, it's an artwork by Michal Naaman. Um, I just added it because I think it's a really beautiful work. It's um, it's a commentary about um, the Golan Heights being the eyes of the nation, and she placed this uh, this is 1974 in um, on the beach, um, explaining the absurdity of of this region being. Uh, captured for uh, basically surveillance. So the projects that we were working on, I'm going to kind of go through. Uh, they trace the exploitation of subterranean resources, agricultural produce, and archaeology as tools for colonization and the persistent civic uh, resistance against it. They identify images from the archive of the Israeli military from the 60s and the 70s. And by adding to these documents um, the layers they omit and geolocating and redrawing the scenarios they depict in today's context, they propose to build a new archive that joins the testimonies to the massive erasure and expropriation of these lands, histories, and these people. So this is a project by Abraham Murel. Uh, the mappings analyze the ways in which agriculture, archaeology, uh, language, and tourism uh, play key roles in the Israeli colonization and appropriation of the Julan, um, and in the erasures of um, traces of past cultivations of the same land. So Abraham Burel uh, identifies those photographs and registering the first steps of Israeli settlement in the Julan. The three main activity, activities were war, uh, tourism, and agriculture. So he isolates the, this is what we're here, the, he isolates the tools, automobiles, uniforms, built structures, seeds that participated in the uh, uprooting of um, previous uh, life from the area. So what may appear as banal um, in photographs like these is then drawn as part of a a larger systematic process of uh, using agriculture um, to take over expansive uh, territories. This is a project by uh, Shawe Lim that, works, that worked mostly on um, the differences in water um, access for Jolani. Uh, five villages, five Jaulani villages remain out of the 250. Um, so what she was doing was uh, trying to understand the differences in water allocation and subsidies and so on 
um, and infrastructures between um, the, settle the Israeli settlements and uh, the Jolani population. Um, and the drawings basically uh, determine that kind of comparison. Another project is um, by Alicia French, where she was cataloging and trying to understand all of the um, interventions in the landscape uh, that make it so that it's possible to go on a, uh, um, you know, weekend getaway in the Golan Heights without actually getting a sense of the 250 um, destroyed uh, villages that scatter around the landscape. And so some of these uh, instruments, which she calls uh, devices of obstruction, are uh, collected and then sort of become uh, signifiers of, okay, so here there is, you know, if you follow these, um, uh, these signals, you will most likely find a destroyed um, or a ruin behind them. For example, everybody is familiar, I think, with the planting of trees, but um, she was working on additional um, signals in the landscape. And then we visited these areas. Um, and she overlaid the various, um, let's say, layers of, um, of truth uh, in this map. So what you see in white are the areas of the destroyed uh, Syrian villages and towns. For Stefan van uh, Eden, he started with a video that he found online of a route that was traveled in the Julan by two, um, and it was just uploaded online, and he, it was his way of kind of entering the area. Um, he, it became his site for the project. Before we traveled, he studied the histories of the areas surrounding this particular route, um, their geology, etc. And once there, we drove the same route while documenting precisely the elements that were invisible in the film. He drew a set of maps uh, from the names and locations of erased villages that are juxtaposed with the names and locations of Israeli settlements and tourism attractions um, that were built uh, on top. The plot divisions and farms have destroyed um, farms since 67. And put together an atlas, a road atlas. Um, it's a book that uh, is like a, is a, a typical road uh, road map that is only particular to this route, where he overlays all of the uh, contradicting informations and kind of um, brings back a lot of the um, let's say haunting memories of that particular part of the Julan. Together, the mappings and the drawing experiment, they form a gesture to all, towards a visual language that can represent the ways in which the Golan Heights uh, colonization is performed, on the one hand, through the violent removal uh, of its inha in original inhabitants and the destruction of their built environment, and on the other, also through very subtle manipulations of uh, the land um, as those being also participants in the uh, ongoing colonial project. The hope of a kind of body of um, visualization work like this is that through this continued experimentation, we can contribute to the drawing of maps that aren't there to exercise control, but are capable to overlay contradictory fragments, um, incomplete narratives. More importantly, it's also um, to maybe contribute to a larger proliferation of uh, future maps of the Julan that are drawn from the memories and imaginaries of all of their people. Um, and together maybe outnumber um, the ones that are drawn to repress and silence them. And I'll finish here. Thank you.
Thank you, Nora, for this uh, very insightful and courageous and, uh, presentation. I think this work, uh, just before uh, opening the, um, uh, letting the audience to ask questions, I would like to uh, give some comments um, or share my thoughts. I think the national project in Israel led to the erasure of so many identities. Uh, and um, it's very important to reconstruct, or let's say deconstruct the hegemonic narrative that is uh, imposed by the state, because many of these narratives, many of these stories, many of this, these maps that you showed are not existing anymore. And uh, just, uh, you know, like engaging in this research is uh, it, very important in <coughs> not only challenging and countering this uh, 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 power structure, but also looking into the, looking into the ground, looking at what, what was remained. And I think at this moment, there is an acceleration of erasure with the nation state law, et cetera. So these testimonies, this evidence, these maps, this material, this research is incredibly important to have. So uh, in that sense, coming from there and trying also to engage with these type of topics, uh, which are metanine, uh, I really, I really appreciate your work, and it was a pleasure to follow the, uh, this presentation. Um, I would like to open the. So I understand the, in I understand the intent and the outcome in terms of challenging the, hegem the, the, the narrative of the state, and reconstructing these lost identities that have been erased. I wonder from a scientific or social scientific point of view whether in terms of archaeological evidence that even predates some of those settlements, you know, what, you know, thinking about LIDAR and some of other techniques that help you think about this, not just at that moment in the 40s or the 60s or whatever it is, but actually thinking in millennia as it may be, how that begins to shape a narrative as well. Um, thank you for the question. That's actually something that I didn't um, mention, but that uh, just last week was a very important part of the course's um, perspective, because we're doing this course again. It was studied by uh, many years ago by Nadia Abu al-Hajj, who wrote the book Facts on the Ground, to understand um, the level of commitment of the Israeli state uh, as it was forming to archaeological um, digging and science and so on. Um, so what you will find in a place like the Golan Heights is that archaeological uh, sites are actually scattered all around the landscape. Of course, all of those that um, date thousand years and more back, right? The last, uh, the, the couple of centuries in between um, are not so, let's say, um, uh, in agreement no, with the Israeli state's narrative. And so those in particular are uh, not there for people to access. But archaeological uh, digging has actually been a very uh, key part of the state's um, reorganization of the landscape, and particularly in the Julan, since it's also a very, um, I showed some of those kind of ski lift images and so on. It's a very touristic um, area. It's, a, it's part of the, uh, an Israeli scholar called uh, Moriel Ram writes about this kind of, uh, dissonance between needing to keep the place as what he calls an encampment, a military encampment, and also normalizing it through touristic activity. Archaeological uh, digs are very much part of that also touristic activity, but then at the same time and also in larger context of the Israeli state, um, as a way of tracing you know, the narrative of the state itself to archaeological remains. and. Um, of course, those require funding and institutions and so on, which are not really available for organizations like Al Marsad, who um, have t it's taken them over 15 years to understand where the villages that where their families used to live, 
were on the ground um, and actually locate them and go and find them. So it's a it's an entirely different way of um, yeah approaching the territory without institutional support really from anywhere. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I thought it was quite good, just building on the previous remark. Um, I mean, I work in the area of sport exclusively, and um, uh, there is also a, a legacy there with respect to the archaeology to the present. And I was particularly interested in your references about archive and who controls the archive. Because of course, in 82, the PLO archive was seized, and um, within those, were the significant sport archives of the PLO. Um, the question that I have in the more contemporary sense um, is, um, is Al Mursad doing any mapping of the movement and flow and concepts of erasure for the 700,000 or so Jewish refugees from Arab countries that were also engaged in a um, erasure project by Arab states during this time in reaction to the constructive um, project of the constructing project of um, the Zionist um, project on the ground um, in historical British Mandate Palestine. Yeah. Almar, that's a very important project to take on. Um, and actually, the narrative of um, uh, Jewish refugees um, also being displaced from the area and also being part of this kind of same uh, or very similar um, uh, fates is, is always present in conversations. Institutions are, Al-Marsad is a very small organization um, that, has, that, only has, that has only been working in the Golan Heights. Um, it's, I think, 15 years. Uh, or so, they rely mostly on volunteer work uh, from legal scholars who come and spend a few years um, working on reports and so on. So Al Marsad itself is not doing this research, and I haven't heard of a research like that being done. But I think it's. I would love to also be directed towards it if you find it. Hi, um, my name is Adam. Thank you for the presentation. I was just wondering if anyone um, has looked into what's called the New Israel Trail, or any of your students, or um, if they would be interested in looking into it as a sort of project, as a sort of embodiment of this uh, erasure of uh, what was of the past. And the New Israel Trail is sort of a hiking trail, which I guess defines a certain um, physical space throughout Israel that tourists take, I think would be an interesting case for, uh, for some people to look at. Yeah, thank you. I haven't, I'm not aware of it. Thank you, I'll note it. Yeah, thank you, Nora. Indeed, courageous uh, how you talk about forms of uh, counter-mapping and counter-narratives. Um, but you started off by, I think, quoting Derrida, um, who was making a plea for an archive that consists of conflicting, contradicting um, bodies of knowledge. And my question is about um, these are the counter-narratives, but how do you reconcile those counter-narratives with the, with the existing more established na narratives, mm -hmm. and especially in, in these post-truth times? Yeah. Uh, how do you let these things come together? Um, so, for example, in, a, in, a, in the case of this last project, uh, none of the signaled um, material uh, presences that are signaled on official maps uh, have been removed. So in a very direct and simple sense, let's say, uh, in these cases, they're simply juxtaposed no, and overlaid. 
um, and the contradictions between them kind of made visible. Uh, in terms of a larger, um, I think the larger version of the question now about um, how to relate to those kind of official, official uh, records that are in fact denying the presence of a lot of what we're talking about. Um, I think I mentioned it a little bit in the end, kind of like a, kind of like a joke because we don't believe we have this kind of power. But uh, it's to render um, render the kind of work that's being done to silence, just to render it irrelevant. Um, it becomes the presence and proliferation no, of, of evidence of things being otherwise becomes so um, obvious. No? If, if everybody's doing maps of the land suddenly and they're all over, then uh, those that are being produced to deny the existence of exactly what we're talking about become simply irrelevant. Uh, it's not so much to find middle ground. It's... Uh, it's to make sure that no one is uh, left out. Thank you again for your presentation. Um, so in terms of the Golan Heights specifically, the reason perhaps that all this went down was because the many states around Israel attacked it in 1967, right? It's not to say, of course, that that makes the erasure of villages okay. But I think that's an important fact to point out. Mm -hmm. um, kind of building on, on Michael's question, I was just wondering, in terms of preserving the histories of these um, villages and communities, how moving forward do you think that that can differ from other narratives where people have, like for instance, Confederate um, monuments and, and people in the US, um, in the south of the US, um, kind of holding on to that history and in a very negative way. How do you think this can be different than that in a way where it both preserves the history, which again is very different than that history, but in a positive way that can lead to many of the positive things that are already going on in the Golan Heights with um, both Jewish and Arab communities working together and, and being together? Thank you. About the first part of the question, there is a, an anecdote um, it's not an anecdote. Moshe Dayan um, is quoted on Haaretz, actually, there's an article, um, talking about the process of uh, you know, the, the, what ignited. You know, the, of course, there were um, issues from before that, but this is an interesting th thing to look into because it speaks exactly about this issue with uh, agriculture playing a very important role. What he was saying is that um, uh, they would send tractors across the border knowing that they would trigger um, a response in 1967 and, um, and that there was this kind of excitement you know, by the farming uh, community in Israel about this, about this land because of what it has to offer you know, in terms of agricultural uh, potential and water and so on. I would encourage looking into this simply because it's um, also architecturally a really interesting um, process you know, of how these actions created um, these new border relations, the crossing of the tractor, uh, etc. Um, in terms of how we see this, um, you know, putting, encouraging, let's say, uh, positive uh, outcomes, the aspirations are not um, that wide. No, the aspirations are also, it's important to remember this is a uh, a course that is also in terms of addressing the Julan as a place that is so complex where it's impossible to really simplify um, and, and, and render it 
a two-dimensional, no simple um, map. What we think is that this can teach us a lot more about the rest of the world and how we represent territories elsewhere. So this is a pedagogical project about um, drawing disputed terrains, right? And the processes in which these terrains are materialized and, and borders are fortified or dismantled, etc. Um, and we think that this kind of work is also can be really useful in thinking about how to represent areas elsewhere, in uh, New York or in Boston or wherever. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about, I mean, everywhere you look, there's probably um, a trace of a crime that has been committed. That is, so this is not unique to the Julan. It's just that the intensity of, uh, of both traces, the steadfastness of people who are working to make, to keep them alive, no? um, and the absurdity of the, how massive the destruction was and how massive this erasure has been, is useful in terms of helping us think through um, how to represent territories otherwise, but also how to think about them differently, not just representationally. Um, it's not so much uh, about how they would affect the Julan's future. Um, it's not there yet. Um, since we addressed um, skiing um, and, you know, traversing boundaries, I think, or territories, I believe, is the title, uh, it's, you know, always a curiosity how the Olympic movement um, defines itself as a traverser of territories and a, a healer of global <laughs> issues. Um, but it's very hard to measure that. But it, um, when you put up the picture of the ski slope in the Golan, it's, it's, it's uh, quite important to know that um, sport was actively organized, sport was actively using the Golan for interterritorial exchange going as far back as the 1920s, mm. um, particularly through Maccabi sports clubs that were um, meeting in the Jolan on Mount Hermon or Jebel Sheikh um, to bring together uh, the community of um, Lebanese and Syrian and uh, British Mandate Palestine slash Israeli Jews of this period. Um, it might also be interested to explore um, in comparison to archival records of sport competition, movement of people across space in, in time. Um, because uh, the sport record is extremely rich. Amazing. And so one can measure and visually <laughs> depict what the IOC always sort of fails to do, which is show how people come together. Yeah. Now, I give the Maccabi case only because they were more organized. But the utilization of this space as a sporting zone um, formally uh, is, certainly pre-exists um, even the creation of the State of Israel. Yeah. And um, I'd be happy to provide you with um, some primary archival footage of that. Wow, yeah, amazing. Thank you. Um, responding, Eric, to your question about producing alternative imaginaries. Um, I think it's, it's hard in the midst of a struggle for rights, for social rights, social, political, etc. rights, uh, to think about, to think beyond. Uh, but I also think it's necessary. Uh, sometimes I think it's something that I'm struggling also with my practice often. It's okay, so how we think beyond the now, how we use not our own, um, let's say, not, uh, we don't project our own ideas on a space, but actually use our uh, tools, our professional knowledge, our designs to give voice to those who might have ideas of how they live, uh, how they want to live their life, the oppressed. And I think oftentimes they have actually really clear ideas of, of how they see their future. So even just um, documenting these testimonies and uh, showing and visualizing them uh, it's possible to somehow, somehow release a lot of fear and uh, challenge uh, you know, some of the institutional narratives about why it's not possible. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I hope that there, you know, like the, the design can play a role in uh, documenting and bringing forward these alternative imaginaries, alternative futures uh, than what we have now. Yeah, yeah the, the project, um, I mean, there are uh, attempts at visualizing imaginaries, um, but there is a really kind of careful um, it stops right before in terms of um, just making sure that the whatever is drawn leaves the gaps that make it possible to imagine things differently, or at least this is how we frame it. Um, it's so yeah. Also in response to your question, the way that it's addressed is that uh, it's, it's never a close and it's never a closed. Um, image of a of a place. There's always a gap or a fracture that um, makes an ima- makes an imagination possible. And some of it, some of these instances are very abstract. Others can actually be felt and understood in the drawings. But yeah. thank you, Nuro. I have a question about the uh, relationship between the projects and the students that undertake them and the communities that they end up working alongside of or or about which they write. Um, Is there a mechanism within the course or throughout the project's completion that gives students the opportunity to uh, speak to or with or share their projects with the communities? Um, And what do those conversations look like? Um, Both in terms of, let's say, the appreciation of a perhaps abstract, complex take on something that is perhaps lived in a more material way on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, what is the political import of these kinds of projects for communities that perhaps have political mobilization on their minds, um, more so than you know the heuristic or pedagogical? Um, thank yeah. you. Um, so this relates also to the Studio X Amman um, initiative in general. The reason why. Um, I feel comfortable you know, doing this kind of work is also because um, these are ongoing relationships that are carried through year after year. Um, they're not a, you know, one of, here you go, group of students, then disappear and no one ever hears of it again. Um, this is what a project like Studio Aktaman allows. We are there. I'm also working in an environment where I have my own friendships and networks and work uh, relationships and so on. Uh, So a lot of that is a personal thing. Uh, It's it's an investment that I have personally that I'm uh, lucky to be able to maintain through my work. Um, In terms of, and and there is a, the tension now between making sure that it remains a pedagogical project that is also um, no, relevant and useful for the um, interests of these, this particular group of students um, and how to develop particular skills or, um, or very specific interests in a topic that we came across. And uh, like I mentioned, working with our um, colleagues in Al-Marsad or um, or others to make sure that this kind of work is, is relevant. And I think the relevance here is, goes back to the issue of relevance. It's not so much is it useful, um, because sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. But it's, is this work, um, uh, or is this particular area of research worthwhile? Is it based on... Um, um, on reliable information, or you know, so that it, so that it's not just um, fuzzy and aloof. Uh, so there is that there's a tension that's constantly being kept. And in terms of bringing the work back, also through the projects of Studio Exam Man, it's always possible to do that. And so that's um, why these relationships continue. Right? Otherwise. Everyone loses interest. So. 
Um, I was also intrigued by, I forgot the name, uh, but this performance artist who seemed yeah. to be reenacting archival material. Could you maybe elaborate on the potential of that kind of engagement with material uh, yeah, from your own practice or your own perspective, maybe? Yeah. I, uh, so as I mentioned, I was introduced to his work. His name is Arkady oh. Zaidis. And I was introduced to his work by a curator colleague who um, uh, was curating an exhibition with his work as part of it. And um, for me, it was... So he was working with um, footage that was photographed as part of B'Tselem's project, the camera project, no, which is where they distribute cameras, um, started in Hebron, so that people can record the um, violence that they experience on behalf of soldiers or settlers and so on, because the legal system obviously um, usually doesn't hold these people accountable. So the hope was that through these cameras there would be a record. Um, and I think the work of Arkady Zaidis for me was um, especially captivating because it felt like he was coming at this. He was coming at the same questions just from the discipline of um, of choreography, and um, in terms of trying to make sure things are not, you know, left into oblivion, and the way he can do that through his field is this obsessive, repetitive. Um, uh, imitation of the actions that he was um, identifying as signifying this kind of collective body of the perpetrator, right? And for me, that was really fascinating because it actually felt, I mean, this is my reading, it might be way off, but it, but for me, it was, it was that, um, after a project like this, like his, with a group, with an audience that was sitting there, um, witnessing him learn every single uh, move of this kind of, of this violence no, that was shown on screen, it gave that archive a life that is um, impossible to destroy. No? Everybody experienced that learning process together with him. Uh, everybody in the audience, and so um, where that can travel is that can never be crushed. And it's this. Um, there's another. It brings up another thing, which is also uh, another kind of tension in a lot of the things we think about in a project like this and others, is that, and it goes back to Jacqueline Rose and her book States of Fantasy, where She's, she, remi she reminds us, I mean, we all know this, but it's exactly that which is um, repressed that always comes back to haunt. And so it also kind of means that it's always that which is immaterial <laughs> that always comes back to haunt. And so there is this, I think, maybe also envy um, of the immateriality of the traces that he produced. Something that I think in architecture where we can't do, we don't know how to do. And for me, that was a fascinating um, translating a material evidence into an immaterial, indestructible form. Thank you, Nola, for sharing with us this uh, uh, important body of work and ideas. Um, and thank you for the conversation. Thank you. All.